This is the Mike LaPetri Show. Nassau County property taxes are way too high. That's why you need Reassessment and Evaluation Services, Inc., the number one tax grievance provider that offers personal service and high success rates. Grieve your taxes now before the deadline on March 1st, 2024. Call today for more info, 516-742-5180, or apply online at reassessmytaxes.com. Regal Customs Brokers, the import community's ally. Whether you're a freight forwarder, importer, or individual, they clear your cargo through customs faster than any other broker around. At Regal Customs Broker, everyone gets the royal treatment. Go to regalbrokers.com for more information today. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We have the Mike Florio in the building, the CEO of Libby, the Long Island Builders Institute is in the house, in studio on the Michael Petri Show. What's up, buddy? Hey, man. How you doing? Great I'm, to be here. I'm so excited to have you here. I mean, you just started. This is so exciting because this is your first year with Libby, working with this, in, this organization that has just had a huge, huge merger uh, just in the past couple of months with the professional remodeling organization, which is incredible. What, bringing your membership to nearly 800 companies, is that right? Somewhere around there, yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, what you, who you guys are, and I want you to break down for many viewers and listeners. I don't know if they realize like how much of a, a Megatron really Libby is. And that's how I look <laughs> at it, just Megatron organization, just standing up for all these different single family and multifamily builders and developers on Long Island. I mean, who are some of your, like, biggest members in your organization like can you expound on that yeah sure so let me just say uh, first of all thank you for having me today it's great to be here and I'm happy to be doing this with you oh you're so kind thank uh, you. you know libby is the long island builders institute you know as an organization it's been around since 1941 that's crazy and you know i think one of the most impressive things about libby is you know when you go into our office you go up in uh, our conference room and there's all these pictures on the wall and you look back, these are all of our past presidents and our, and our associate council presidents. And these are the, the men and, you know, some women in there, but the, the people that built Long Island. You know, you think back of how we grew, you know, in, in post-World War II as a suburban, you know, place for people from New York City to escape. And, you know, the guys up on that wall are the guys that built this, you know, go all the way back to like the Levittown days. So it really is a, an incredible organization. Uh, you know, as you said, I've been there for a year so I'm very fortunate to be in this position. My predecessor, Mitch Paley, was there for uh, 12 years, I believe, and did a, you know, did a tremendous job. Uh, but we are really focused on the, the home building and remodeling industry here on Long Island. We go from you know, one end to the other, and uh, I've learned it's a pretty big island, you know, traveling all around the, to different spots. Um, but it's a great organization, you know, dedicated professionals. You know, we do a combination of provide networking opportunities for people to get in front of builders, you know, people that are you know, building these either multi, multi-story uh, you know, family projects and apartments to single family homes to just guys that are doing, you know, remodeling and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, the people are great. It is, uh, again, we do networking, we do education. And, you know, the most important I think we do is government relations. So my job is really to be out there, uh, to be educating elected officials on the issues that we have you know, it's very regulated, goes through a lot of the towns here on Long Island, so we work with a lot of town supervisors and town councils, uh, work with the state on, on, on bigger issues that affect, you know, us throughout the, the state of New York. Um, but, you know, I'm very happy to be here. It's a tremendous opportunity, and, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a great spot for me to continue. I've worked in politics and government here for, you know, over a decade uh, on Long Island. I grew up here. And this is an opportunity for me to continue that going forward and, and to, you know, make sure that this is a place where we're, I, me and my wife can raise our family and keep our kids here. Oh, that's the seminal issue, right? And the focus. That's what mm-hmm. we always want is the same goals, which is the great mentality. And we have to have that both Democrat, Republican alike. You got to have the same goals of growing Long Island out to make it a place where our children, grandchildren can stay and thrive, right. which is most important. I think Libby does a tremendous job. I remember when I was in the state assembly. Uh, Libby was was there. They were present on many of the bigger issues. And that's where I want to talk about today. I want to talk about both the local side and the state side. And the local side, I know it's been huge in the sense of the wait times for building permits and the unchecked operation of contractors without licenses. That's like a, that's like a seminal focus for you guys. But then in this, on, the, on the same side with the state issues, you have the Hochul housing proposal that we saw in 23. Then you also have, I want to talk about good cause eviction, which is what we've heard time and time again, that you see those in the state Senate 
uh, wanting to push the progressives over there. And then you have uh, the scaffold law as well as I want to talk about the gas stove ban, all those in flux. I mean, first a lot of, a lot of fun issues. There a lot to- of fun <laughs> issues that people, I think, need to realize what's going on. Yep. It sounds complicated. And we're looking to kind of break that down for the listeners sure. say, okay, this is what's going on in Long Island, how it's affecting me as a homeowner, how's it affecting me with children, how's it affecting my schools, how's it affecting my lifestyle. And I think people want to know, okay, to see that nexus. And so really let's, let's focus on this local side because I want to just mm-hmm. get that right out, right out of the way where locally building permits and uh, these licenses. This just sounds to me like as an average person, if you're looking at it, building permits, why do I really, like, why did, why did the town make this so hard to do? I, I, ha- I want to make an adjustment to my house or I want to build out something new. I have to go through this whole rigorous process and it's, it's just stifles everything. It costs tons. Time is money. And then at the same time, you got these contractors with licensing. Do they need licensing? What's the whole point of that? What, 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 where are we on this? So let, let's hear about these permits and the licensing sure. side. So just to go back to a question you asked originally, you know, who's, who are some of our members? Okay. We have members from you know big guys like TriTech. I was yeah. just out doing uh, visiting their project at, at the Ronkonkoma Hub. You know, which is tremendous. Monster. Okay. We have guys like B2K, you know, formerly Engel Berman that are doing the, the towers in Long Beach. I visited there recently. Again, you know, stuff you're not, you, you're not used to seeing on Long Island. They're doing just these beautiful big projects. And it's like, why can't we have more of that here? So I have guys like that, guys in the middle, you know, a guy like Anthony Bartone uh, and Marty Detling. You know, Anthony Bartone just did a new project in Westbury. Marty Detling in Albany is doing um, Wine Dance Rising. And then guys all the way down to single family home builders, you know, who guys do a small subdivision, four or five houses a year. Vince Calvoso, our, who is our current president right now, he's a small single family builder. Take. He started out as a framer, you know, built up his own company. He's been doing it for 30 years. Very knowledgeable person in the industry. Um, one thing all those guys have in common is building permits. Building. Okay. You, need, you know, you got to go through the towns or villages to get these. And the process is taking way too long. Why? Well, you know, some people say it's a backup from COVID still, right? Where, you know, things were put on hold. Um, There's numerous reasons, but it's really that a lot of these towns are not properly staffed, okay? They don't have the the right number of people there. They have people that aged out. You know, no one's coming into these. You know, no one's saying I want to grow up and work for the town of Hempstead or the town of uh, Smithtown. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know. They're, they're getting people that, all right, you'll get in there. It's, it's, you know, they don't pay much in salary. You get good benefits and stuff like that. But uh, we need to do a better job of finding candidates to fill these jobs. That, and you know, the volume has increased, and we're still using technologies that's probably like in the 1950s for many of these places. Wow. A lot of paper pushing back and forth. We've seen some municipalities, the town of Hempstead, for example, the town of uh, Huntington, and now others are talking about this using a process called e-permitting. So just as you can do things online now, I mean, like how many things can we do on our phone? And we see where it's going. You know, you order something online, you get a notification when it's shipped, where it is, how it's going. You put your building permit in, you know, goodbye. Kiss it goodbye. You got to have someone go through a stack and find it. And then, you know, I get called all the time. Hey, where's my permit? Can you help me find my permit? What's happening with it? Maybe I can get it from here to here in the stack. Um, and then people go out and they hire expediters and stuff that, you know, know people in there and they try to get it moved up mm-hmm. and down. You should be able to submit it into a portal, track it where it goes, you know, whose desk it goes to, who reviews it. Right. And then, you know, get a notification, hey, your permit's been approved. Or if, <clears throat> if there's problems with it, address them. Email and, sent back to you. Right. Just for, for some- you know, sometimes people will some- put something in and they'll be missing something and they'll go through the whole process, wait six weeks, eight weeks or more in some places and it gets spit back, and they said, oh, you forgot about this. You go right back to the bottom of the pile again. It, it, it's ridiculous. Um, we're, we're seeing a lot of towns are looking at the technologies, and I think that is uh, the easiest thing we could do. I mean, it, it's, it, you don't have to recreate the wheel. It's software that's available off the shelf. You can get it. You can implement it. And it does more than building permits, too. It does a whole bunch of other things and other permits and licensings you need uh, that goes to the town. But it would be very helpful to combine that with some type of, you know, adding some employees, uh, so maybe some more technical employees. Right. The IT side of things. That's yep. what, I mean, that's, that's to me is outrageous when you're hearing even paper 
is still like oh, I mean, still, you're still, still literally getting stamps in places. That's what I'm and, saying. Yeah. It has that affect your members now in terms of what they're able to do. How does it affect their businesses? How does it affect their growth? I mean, even just the well, their uh, volume that they can it, handle. It hurts projects because listen, a lot of the times you know you're borrowing money. Interest rates are higher right now because okay, mm-hmm. so you're paying more for it. So the longer you wait, you know your carrying costs are increasing, and you know it makes it harder to finance these projects. You know, the thing about Long Island is it's not that we're not doing a lot of different projects. It's just that the process takes forever. Uh, you know, we've all heard about the, you know, the town board meeting or a hearing or something like that. You know, we call, you know, the angry people, the NIMBYs, you know, not in my backyard, come out and say, no, 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 we don't want that. We don't want that. And, you know, 20 people show up to a meeting. What you don't see, though, is there's, you know, 500 people out there that, you know, aren't really hot and excited to come out to a, a hearing and speak in favor of it, but they're like, yeah, I'd rather have a nice development there than this vacant piece of property that has right. weeds growing through it and garbage all over the place. And when people hang out in the corner and you know, throw bottles. I was uh, uh, laughing the other day, you know, on uh, 111, not far from my office, there's uh, two vacant properties that used to be fast food restaurants. They want to put two new fast food restaurants in and people around it are complaining. Oh, we like the vacant land the way it is. We don't want the traffic and stuff. I said, you bought a home near two pieces of... Why do you want vacant yeah. land? I don't get that. So, you know, that's, that's part of the problem is that, you know, the, it, Long Island is home to NIMBY, right? Yeah. We don't, we don't like stuff. Um, you know, we want more things. We want affordable housing. We want new developments. We just don't want it where we are. Right, just not it, here. <laughs> right, do it in just someone else's place. Class, I mean, that's what not, not my backyard is. Mm-hmm. And so with that, I mean, so now we talked about with the permitting, there's also those unlicensed contractors. Are they still able to get these permits? Like, how, like, are they still a part of that? But, Or are they just circumventing? Like, how is that yeah, different so, in the sense uh, for your you membership? Know, a lot of our members and the remodelers that we've added in uh, – you know, we, we have a code of ethics that we stand by. Uh, and, you know, we, we have edu- educational training and stuff. So you're getting uh, professionals with the right insurance, the right skill set, you know, to, to do the job. Uh, and if there's a problem, you can come to us. We actually have a compliance committee. And if there's a problem between a, you know, a homeowner and a contractor or something like that, we'll help work it out. Oh, great. Uh, so that's, you know, that's something we kind of police ourselves. You know, the different... Uh, you know, either whether it's code enforcement or consumer affairs. I mean, they're they're overburdened. I mean, they do they do some things, but they they're not going to catch catch every bad actor. And there are people out there that you know, you get a home improvement license from the county. That's a general home improvement license that allows you to do a lot of different things. You know, the guy that's doing landscaping all says sudden says, "Oh, I can do roofing too." You know, you're probably not qualified for that. You probably don't even have the right insurance to cover that. You know, God forbid something should happen. So it's very important to use. Uh, qualified, you know, licensed professionals, and I would, you know, check them up on the on the county websites, make sure there's no violations. Uh, you know, call call Libby. I mean, we we have a thing called Libby's List where we have recommended contractors. You say I need, you know, I need flooring or I need cabinets or I need roofing. You know, we have our preferred members uh, or our members that that do that type of work. Right, to show so people can just see in those specialty areas, like this is what you want if you want roofing, this right. is what you want if you want flooring, or what is outside, or in certain, certain yeah. types of things. But you know, listen, there's, whatever there's, it may be. there's guys out there, you know, who's, who's got a truck and they stick a sign on and they say, okay, I can, I'm a home improvement contractor. Right. And they don't have the skill set to do it. They don't pay, you know, their employees the right wages. So they, they undercut the other professionals out there that are trying to do everything the right way. They're paying, you know, competitive wages, they're paying insurance, they're paying different things. I like the fact that you have a self-monitoring because one bad apple spoils the whole bunch. That's always the problem. So you don't want to have that where Libby's reputation is so uh, such a high standard. Last thing you want is these guys who are coming in, these jerk-offs that are going to then do crap work, yep. and then all of a sudden that hurts your brand right. and your reputation that you built since 1940s, mm-hmm. it was, which is incredible. I mean, listen, in, in, any, in any profession, right, you're going to have people that are looking to, you know, undercut you or, uh, you know, gain some type of competitive edge. That's just the nature of the beast. Um, but, you know, we try to hold ourselves to a, a higher standard. And let, let's be clear, too. So these municipalities, they're still going to be handing out the permitting process to those who are unlicensed, can still get it, correct? They can still well, get the building they, permits? They would be licensed, but they, could, they, could, you know, they have a license. But a license, a license that's right. my point, a general right. license. They don't, they don't check into their you know, insurance requirements and stuff like that to see, do they have the professional expertise to do correct. these types of jobs? So that's my point for, for, the, for the layman homeowner yep. who is not aware. 
they, they they're just assuming like, oh yeah, they wouldn't they wouldn't be able to get this permit unless they could do that. That's not right. true. No, I mean, listen, if you if you were going to undertake a big job, you're going to go put an extension on your house or something like that. I would check uh, qualifications. I'd ask for insurance. I would ask for references from other homeowners who did it. Uh, you don't you don't want to get stuck, especially on a big project like that, with with a problem at the end. And of where that. they where can homeowners find Libby's list? You can go to Libby.org, L I B I dot O R G, and you'll see Libby's list there, and you click on it, and it'll give you a list. If if you have any other specific questions, you could always call our office as well. All the information is on our website. Awesome. What's the number to reach you for that? Uh, 631-232-2345. Awesome. I mean, that's the keys because we – on this show, that's the very seminal purpose is that people listening, they under, they learn, they can gather further information to be more educated for those – especially that amount of money that they're spending. Yeah. Last thing I ever want to see is a homeowner – who gets screwed because of some bad apple. I mean, listen, the home is the, the biggest investment many people will probably you know, make in their life. And now on Long Island, you know, ever since the pandemic, it's, you've seen there's such a limited supply of homes, and the homes that are going for sale are astronomical. I mean, every, every month you keep looking, you've seen, oh, record you know, sale price in Nassau County, median sales price, record in Suffolk. It keeps going up and up and up and up and up. And you know, the interest rate situation is... is not helpful right now to no. homeowners, you know, but you got to think there's such demand at 7% interest. You know, what if that comes down to five, you know, those people that say, Oh, I'm not in the market at 7%, but if it comes back down to five, I'm looking, Yeah. you know, that's going to, there's still a constricted supply going on. So unless we build more, we're never going to get out of this problem. It's just going to keep getting worse and worse. Uh, so that's what, you know, we're advocating for is the only way to, you know, help the affordability problem is to expand the supply. Correct. And have, you know, d different types of homeownership. I always say that, you know, here on Long Island, our cycle of housing is broken. You know, what I mean by that is we do single family housing. Great. Okay. This is, you know, suburban World War II. This is what people came mm -hmm. after that. Uh, you know, the Levittown communities. People moved out here. We did, we did the white picket fence and the house and the green grass and, the, you know, the Little League parade. We did that tremendously well. Um, and that's probably like 80 to 85% of our housing stock here. What we're, where we're broken is we don't have a lot of rentals and apartments, mm -hmm. okay? And what we do have is, is very expensive. So we don't have the two ends of the spectrum where you have younger people that are, you know, get, coming out of high school or uh, uh, graduating from college and looking for a job to stay here and a place to live here. They don't have a place where they can go with their friends and hang out, you know, and split a two bedroom or something like that or get right. a studio. Um, and then our seniors who are like, you know what? I raised my family. I got four bedrooms here. I don't need it anymore. I don't want to mow the lawn. Okay. I don't want to have to clean, do all this other stuff that comes with the upkeep of the house. I don't want to pay the property taxes. Property taxes is one of the biggest problems we have here on Long Island. I want to move to a 55 and older community or get an apartment somewhere where I can, you know, meet up with my friends too. We can go have uh, dinner and lunch and stuff like that and walk the downtown and go to the park or museum. We don't have those things. You, some places you see that have been successful, you look at a place like Patchogue, Westbury, you know, Mineola, Farmingdale. Those are communities that have embraced this, you know, downtown living apartment rental community. But we need more of that on Long Island. And I think that leads us to our next point with the Hochul housing proposal. I mean, that was a stress. You heard it earlier in 23 was about more housing, more housing, more housing. Governor Hochul puts out this policy. I had a great episode, episode seven, for those who want to listen, uh, with Larry Levy, Dean of Suburban Studies for Hofstra, who broke that policy down uh, piece by piece about the pros and cons of it. Where was Libby? in that position of that housing proposal, that Lib specific housing proposal, yeah. and what, if you're for or against it, or if you want tweaks, wh what would you like to see? Libby was supportive of the overall goal of the policy. Of course, as a building organization, how could we be against building more homes? Right, right? Okay. which is the goal, right? The that's goal. what it was. That was the goal, and that's, that's what I said, but, you know, we need to build more in order to alleviate the crisis. However, the way in which it was rolled out and the requirements in it, we had some issues with. Mainly, you know, they had this oversight board in there that, you know, state the run. The New York State Oversight yeah. Board, yes. And, you know, and when talking with our members, I said, you know, is there ever an, a chance anyone would think they would actually utilize this? And they said no. Because, you know, the problem is if you go to a town here and you say, I want to I do this project, and the town says no, you know, under the, the way the law was, you know, you had to wait three years if, to see if the town met its housing goals. And if not, you could appeal to the state, and the, and the state can override the local zoning. 
and you know, it's, it, was, it was too long and complex a process. Plus, if you ever got it done, you know, you have like the scarlet letter on you. So you want to go and do another project here. And the, the next town says, wait, weren't you the guys that just went next door and, you know, you appealed it to the state? We don't, we don't want to work with you. Because then you overrode the local community. Right. So, you know, local zoning is something very near and dear to all Long Islanders' hearts. Yeah. The way the system the government was set up many, many years ago, you know, this New England style. That's why we have so many school districts and different taxing districts. Everyone likes to have their own local control out there. So the, the thought of ever the state, you know, the big bad state of New York and Albany, you know, which has a bad reputation, no offense, <laughs> but coming into your local community and telling them what to do was never going to fly here. And you saw that right from the bat. People came out against it. What we think would be a lot better is having uh, different incentives out there. You know, there was $250 million that were put up for, you know, for grant money. Yes. That's a good start, but it's not enough. What, what uh, you would know, you want to see? You know, I think the last proposal was somewhere about $500 million. I mean, double that, that's good. You know, it probably needs to be somewhere about a billion dollars. I mean, the problem with Long Island and a lot of places in Suffolk County is that we lack the critical, critical infrastructure to do some density projects. So sewers, you know, sewers are a big deal on yeah. Long Island, a big deal in Suffolk County. We just went through this, um, you know, referendum debate in Suffolk County recently. Uh, well, you know, hopefully that gets resolved because sewers are good. We need sewers. They're very expensive. Um, so we need to do what we can to get federal and state money in here to help with that. If we have sewers, we can expand density in more areas. Uh, but then you know, with density, you also have to worry about waste collection. Then you have to worry about water water supply. Right. Don't you have to worry about those issues as well? Well, that's why the sewering helps that because, you know, you can't do that with the, the septic tanks and even the, the right. new IA systems are not, you know, are not enough for that. That's why sewering is the best thing we could do. More, more people can connect to it and it, and it helps preserve our, our waterways. What about the concern of many about by having more of these apartments or multifamily housing, we're just extending out Brooklyn and Queens to... You know, I... I I never got that argument. I mean, it, may, it might be a generational thing. Yeah, help know? me understand that. Why don't you get it? I mean, because I think the people that use that argument, you know, don't make us queens. Or, okay, we're never going to be that. That That's a totally different animal. I think when you look back, you know, my parents' generation and my grandparents' generation, they moved out from the city because the city was just, you know, overcrowded. Yes. You know, dirty, right? You came out to the beautiful bucolic scenes out here on Long Island, and that's where you established your home. I, I don't see that anymore. I mean, if you look at some of these places they're building... They're beautiful, you know, these apartments. You know, the amenities they have in it. I was just at one day, you know, there's a chef's kitchen downstairs. It's pretty incredible. You got a pool, you got a weight room, you got pickleball in some places. You know, people love that now. <laughs> uh, the, it's, it's, you know, as a couple of guys were telling me, it's the amenities now. People will sacrifice living space in order to have more of these amenities available to them. Those luxuries. The luxury thing. Yeah. And, and everyone's putting that type of stuff in. You know, you always have a community room with the bar and stuff that you can rent out and the shuffleboard table. and it, it, They're nice places. Yeah, I mean, they, they look great. And that's, I, I mean, that's why it's a, it's a, I don't know, a dissonance in the sense of, of many people where they're, they're worried, they're saying, okay, we have these homes. But at the same time, especially in, in areas that are vacant, mm -hmm. dilapidated, where, what else are we building there? If we're not building anything else, then why not housing? Exactly. Which is an argument that I, I give them that, that has merit. I mean, you look at some places around here, drive, you look at all the strip mall. I mean, listen, the retail landscape in, in this country is changing. Changing you know, radically. And it's Amazon and, and you know, everything else. I hate People, Amazon. Right. They destroyed... They've destroyed small business, uh, the, small business retail, and they I can't have, stand that. That's why know, I want competition. That's a whole separate argument. But <laughs> we'll I want, have that I, another I, day. I, those guys have become the mega company behemoth that's basically terrible in my eyes right. of long term. But even you know, we order most things online now. Yeah, I mean, I know. You, go, you go to the store; it's really it's a showroom to make sure you like it in real life, yeah. and then you go online and order it. That's basically well, what Best Buy has become, right. right? They just have it where look, these are our products, and now if you want to order it, we'll just ship it to you. Exactly. There's no; they hardly have any inventory in the stores and yeah. stuff like that. It all comes from a warehouse somewhere. So the retail landscape has changed. So we have to look at these places that instead of letting them to sit there and become dilapidated and you know run down, what else can we do? You know, look at our all of our malls on Long Island. I know. You know, Sunrise Mall is. I was just going to say. I don't even Sunrise know if they're still operating. By, by okay. People. You know, Broadway Mall and Hicksville's hanging on. I mean, Roosevelt Field's probably still doing decent. But you know, these big spaces that were you know built for shopping centers, what are we going to do with them? Right. Um, so that's a place we can have a mixed use. You know, uh, you know, the town of Huntington is re-examining the Melville Corridor. 
You know, so that was a big employment corridor and you know, still is to this day. Yeah. But you're seeing now the changing dynamics of work. You know, more people are working from home. They may not be full, you know, full time at home now, but there's a hybrid schedule. So how are we repurposing these office buildings? You know, the class A marketplace is, is great, but some of these older rundown buildings are not doing so well. So now we're looking at uh, rezoning or the town's looking at rezoning that, putting in mixed use buildings. We have you know, newer communities. There. There's a lot of space. You know, you can have a lot of connectivity. Uh, through you know bike paths and trails and you know put the supermarket in there for the community right now there's something they're missing yeah see and that's my I guess that goes to the the thought process where do we does the state need to step in in that respect where if you're still having towns that are amenable but there it's more of that that dialogue of what we can do what's going to make it the best best optimal mm -hmm. use, but at the same time, that's also pragmatic in the sense of those ancillary collateral concerns that are associated with, and you have any more of uh, growth in population. Right. I mean, I think the state in pushing the idea is, is driving the conversation, and the conversation needs to be had. I don't think there's anyone here uh, that would say, oh, no, housing is not a problem on the island. Mm -hmm. I mean, you talk to anyone, yeah, it's a problem. It is too little of it, and what's available is not affordable. Yeah. yeah. So we, we got to fix it. Now, the question is, how do we go about doing it? Is it this mandated approach where you have, you know, the state telling you what to do? Or does the state, now the governor's, you know, pivoted a bit and let, done executive orders that really lay out criteria. And, you know, if you're a municipality that wants to do more of this stuff, you know, you pick out where you want to do it. You change your zoning, okay? You come up with a plan and you get deemed a pro-housing community. And with that, you get prioritized for certain grants, and there's $650 million in state grants available through different types of programs that you get, you know, bumped to the top of the list for. Yeah, see, so I like that. Where that's, that, that's the it. carrot method. Yeah, exactly. That's just enticing people to make those changes, and you'll get those state funds mm -hmm. allocated. What? So you were saying about doubling those grants from 250 to $500 right. million. What else would you want to see done to... to I, I mirror, think, you know, mirror, mirror your, your plan. Your I mission. would just think, you know, you got to have buy in from the local communities. So you got to have to, you really have to lay out a vision and then, and then sell it and get people on board with you. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, increased outreach here, working with local officials, looking at some of these properties and saying, you know what, why can't, you know, let's take, you know, uh, one of the malls. Why can't we do something here? Let's bring in the different stakeholders and say, okay. is this, does this make sense? You know, there's a project here on Long Island that could be transformational, the, the Heartland Project uh, in Brentwood, mm -hmm. that, you know, has approvals and stuff. It's ready to go. I mean, it, you know, if you drive through there now, you're like, well, what is this place? You know, what are we doing here? I mean, you know, getting the, the players together and trying to figure out how to get that project over the finish line would be tremendous and a tremendous sign of, you know, oh, wow, we got something going on here. But, you know, look at, look at again, Ronkonkoma Hub. You know, the fact that that got done is, is amazing. But again, it had buy-in from all the key players in that area, and they got it They got it done, and they're progressing with it today. I think, is, that, that's, is it Zeldin the one who brought in federal monies to that? Uh, I'm sure he did. probably his district, yeah. Yeah, because the Ronkonkoma, that was a, I know that was a big issue with also expanding mm -hmm. it out, and all, which is what you're talking about, buy-in in all different right. levels of government. With I mean, the even, even the, you know, the super block in Long Beach, that, that property sat vacant for... 40-something years until, you know, B2K was able to come in there and figure it out. Matinica Court in Huntington took 44 years That's crazy. for that project to get done. You know, they're breaking ground. I, I live not far from there. I drove by the other day. I saw the, you know, buildings rising. And That's it's excellent. tremendous. Well, how many floors is that? Is it? It's, uh, I think, two. I mean, it's a multi-building, multi yeah, you know, two stories. That's what I'm you're, right. still, you're still maintaining a certain height, certain parameters. Yeah. And that's what I mean about how it's working, government's working with developers to find that happy medium where all, all, all parties Listen, are happy. Listen, most developers don't want to force their way into a community and tell them, hey, this is, I'm, I'm coming to put this in your town or your village or whatever it is. They want to give feedback. Okay, they want to have a smooth process of getting you know their entitlements and stuff like that all, all done and you know getting to work so the, the, and no one's looking to say i'm going to put something in here that's out of character with the community right. you, know, you got all single family homes and i'm going to build a you know 10 story uh, apartment building it's not going to happen they want to tie it in with that it, it works so much better yeah. when that happens and libby how's libby's relationship 
with the governor's office? Are you involved in those conversations? Are you having those discussions? I mean, we've, we've had several conversations with the governor's office, the uh, Office of Housing and Community Renewal, regarding mm -hmm. this. I think we're having one uh, upcoming, too. You know, we work through a statewide organization called NISBA, which is the New York State Builders Association. We have a discussion with them as well. Um, you know, we, we're, you know, Libby is, you know, we're a political organization at the end of the day. Well, that's great that you're, that my point is that's great that Long Island's having a voice yes. and see the table when it comes to these discussions to make it known if we're good with it or we're bad with it, specifically when it's affecting directly mm -hmm. our communities and our homeowners, which is amazing. And, and, and now just to pivot with that, you know, because we're looking at the growth, the building of the homes, but now you hear there's good cause eviction that's been year after year pushed. Mm -hmm. So you have the pivot on one side where, you're, I mean, we're pivoting from the one side of developers building these homes, but now when you have the homes and people wanting to rent them out, they're hearing good cause eviction, mm -hmm. which which is a bad name for it. It's it, it, precisely, and that's what I wanted to talk about is those details of how it's going to be deathly for many of the homeowners and those who are who are renting out because what it create where's Libby stand on on that respect uh, Libby is adamantly against the current proposal for good cause eviction yeah and, and I think that's interesting just for you just just to juxtapose how you're framing with the Hokel proposal where it's good good goals mm -hmm. and then here it's just like yeah. this one's a, a well, the, the, gov the governor is also against good cause eviction and has been uh, pretty stalwart on that and helped you know, push it back as it uh, tried to make moves in the legislature this year you know the concept of good cause eviction is that uh, it, it makes it very hard to get rid of a bad tenant let's say but it's good cause you know, what do you mean you gotta I mean, have good you have to good cause to get rid of them okay which you know it, it's extraordinarily hard to evict someone. And as we talked about mm -hmm. earlier, you know, you could have one bad apple spoiling the bunch, okay? Yes. You could have one person that, you know, they're playing loud music, they're not paying their rent, you know, they're disruptive to other tenants or something like that. Can't get rid of them. You have to be able to, you could basically, they have to get, they have unlimited renewal of their, their lease in perpetuity. Which is crazy. Which is me. crazy. So and they get, so after you, a homeowner rents out their home or a portion of home, whatever it may be, and they say you could stay here for a year, six months, three months. Once that lease is signed, according if the, if good cause eviction was in law, once that lease is signed, you're saying now that tenant can stay there forever. Perpetuity basically. rights. Yep, that's one to part. your home. Yes, okay, basically <laughs> takes away your property rights. The second, <laughs> the second crazy. part of it is that your the amount of uh, money you can raise rents is capped. So you know, people want to reinvest. In their properties. Mm -hmm. Hey, you want to, you know, hey, listen, you know what? I'm not going to rent it to you this year because I want to, I want to paint it. I want to fix it up. I want to, you know, you want to invest in it and then maybe be able to rent it for a higher price. Can't do that either. So, so you're stuck there. So really it disincentivizes an owner to put any money into their property. So my home, I'm capped with how much I can get ROI after, after investing in my home with mm -hmm. certain, uh, certain changes. And then I have this tenant who now has taken over my home yep. in perpetuity. What about they don't pay rent? Then what if they? You can take them to court, but it's a long process and it's you know very difficult. And you know it, it just it, it really if good cause eviction were to pass, okay, my members have told me they will stop doing business in New York. They will stop moving, not because they want to, but there's no incentive for them, and they won't be able to get the financing needed to build these projects. Why I can't mean, they get the financing? Because the, the banks and lenders and, and private equity will look around and say. I'm not going to invest in New York because you're capped on how much, you know, you can have all these renter problems. Right. You know, I'll go to, you know, Virginia. They don't have this law. Right. I can build it, you know, probably cheaper there and I can get a better return on my investment. So, right. you know, they'll, they'll do it. I mean, guys who told me if it pa passes, they're closing up shop and moving south. Wow. And, and that's the problem. You know, North Carolina, Virginia, South Carolina, we, we all hear, we all know of people that are like, oh, I'm go once I'm done, you know, yes. whether you retire, your kids go to school, yep. once I'm done, I'm out of here. I'm yep. going to the Carolinas. I'm going to Arizona, Texas. Listen, it's easier out there. You know, we went to a National, uh, a wow. national Association of Home Builders conference uh, earlier this year in Washington, D.C. And the funny thing is, there's this small group from New York and South Carolina had its own bus. No you way. Know, they're like, they're, uh, accidentally get on the bus. That's how I figured it out. <laughs> but we were going, I said, wow, everyone here is from South Carolina. They got an accent. This is kind of weird. I was on the wrong bus. Yeah. Uh, luckily, it was all going to the same place. But, you know, they, they're, just, they're building so much more out there. It's so much more. So much different. And, you know, they're, and their permitting process. I got guys that tell me, I go to Florida. I pay a fee. I get my permit like that. 
you know, big differences. Just, the, yeah. All the costs associated with the carrying costs, with investment costs, and then the yeah. ROI is minimal is limited. And then why, you, if you're capping the ceiling of where I can go to, mm -hmm. but you're establishing that this is my minimum of cost, that does it really pay? Right. That's and that's, that's, that's then that's what you know a lot of when you look at there looking at a project saying does this thing pencil out, it's hard. You know, and that's why pl things like the IDA are so important, important here on Long Island because it helps fill that gap. A lot of these projects without IDA assistance would not get done. Yeah, and, then, and, and then people always, you know, frame it as, oh, this giveaway to developers. It's not like the developer walked in with, you know, a bag of, you know, the, they said, here's just $20 million to go help you. It's taken a piece of property that had, you know, X as its tax base. Right. And if it continued like that, it would have been this. Now you take it, you, re you develop it, and you slowly ramp it up to you know, 10, 15, 20 years out. You're paying much more. You've generated economic activity in the surrounding area. It's a net benefit to the community and to Long Island to have these done than to leave it the way it is. A hundred percent. We had a great issue, a uh, great episode about that with IDAs, with uh, ABLI, mm -hmm. uh, Kyle from there. Oh, Kyle, a good friend of mine. Yeah, he's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. He did a whole thing on it, just talking in length mm -hmm. about how exactly that. It's such a benefit to, to growth and building. Yep. So so good, so good cause eviction, that's going to be pushed in 24. The problem, and we can, and the we problem right now with good cause eviction is that it's become part of the conversation. So anything, my feeling is anything you try to do on housing has to be tied to that. Has to be tied to it, wow. and and we're gonna have to try to figure that out. And there's um, no way you could do both because no, it, it, it's it, it's completely antithetical to housing growth. That's exactly what that's the exact point I make. Yeah, that, listen, you can't say I want more housing here, and then I want to do good cause eviction because you negate this over here. Yeah, it's a total net zero. Then what's the whole point we're doing all this? Exactly. You, you could put anything you want in terms of incentivizing. You could you could put a billion dollars. You were saying about yeah. half half a billion, a billion dollars, and mm -hmm. still you'd have yeah. builders leaving and saying no. Because it's my property it. can be immediately turned over, mm -hmm. which is incredible. Just just that in perspective. I, I, I have questions with property rights, all that, constitutionally, et cetera, yeah. which is a whole separate argument. But let alone and, – and what are the responses when you have – those who are proponents of good cause eviction, do they care? Do they know? They, I mean, look, it, it's, learning? it's generally driven by, you know, the progressives in New York City for the most part. Right. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think you find many state representatives on Long Island who are fans of good cause eviction. Um, How can you be? <laughs> right. It, it, you know, you shouldn't be in office if then if you're supporting good cause eviction. Right. Um, but it's really being driven by, the, you know, the, the interests of the city. And unfortunately, that, you know, holds a lot of sway. Unfortunately for Long Island, you know, the, with the makeup of the legislature right now, the assembly is strongly in Democratic hands. Right. The uh, Senate, Senate is, is Democratic, but, you know, we only have two representatives in that, in the majority. Monica, on Monica Martinez and Kevin Thomas, who have been great on this issue, you know, who have stood tall and, and pushed back against it. Um, but, you know, they're going to have another uh, tough fight up there this year on this. Yeah, with 24 now, I'm, uh, what I'm more concerned more about is that the city is just looking at Long Island as simply a, a breeding ground for, for money mm -hmm. to, for them to just take but nothing never to give back. And the, and the ramifications of policies that may negatively affect Long Island is who cares? How do we make sure? And that's why I think it's so important to talk about Libby's impact because how do we make sure Long Island's voice is still formidable uh, I mean, in know, this state? That's, you know, that's the role we like to play by, you know, talking to uh, state officials, local officials, federal officials. You know, the problem Long Island has is that, like you said, we're sort of the ATM for both the federal government and the state government. We send Same. a lot of money to Albany. We send a lot of money to D.C., and we don't get nearly enough in return. So, you know, now, even if you look at a place like the MTA, you know, they just put out their 20-year uh, capital budget or capital plans recently. And, you know, there was nothing transformational. I said, you know, the kind of attitude is like, you know what, we just gave you Grand Central Madison and we gave you Third Track and we built the Elmont uh, train station. Yeah, you guys are good. You're good for a while. We're going to go invest in some other places there. You know, we still have, we still have needs here. Um, you know, we want to electrify the Port Jefferson branch. We want to move the Yapank station in, in, in Brookhaven. You know, there's a lot of things and needs we have. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting to see how the next few years develop. And I'm, I'm happy to see that Libby's leading the charge in, your, in our voice. And some two other issues before we wrap it up. Mm -hmm. I really want to just highlight is we've talked, you've heard about scaffold law, basically what is it, how does it affect it, and then I really want to highlight this gas stove ban that you see. There's a huge, there's a lawsuit mm -hmm. now on it, and so 
real quick with the scaffold law. Just scaffold like, law is a law that is only unique to New York uh, that says that any time you're six inches or more above the ground, yeah. that the uh, employer is 100% liable. 100% right. liable. So a guy could be you know, drinking on the job, you know, falls off a ladder, and scaffold law says it's the employer's fault. Uh, you know, it, it, it contributes probably 20% more to our insurance costs, which, you know, on, on huge products, there's a great graphic that shows to build a bridge from New York to New Jersey, you know, the insurance on the New York side is like $22 million. Same project, the insurance on the New Jersey side is $10 million. Wow. You know, it just shows that, the, so it's, it's something that, you know, we're fighting against. Uh, we're probably going to have a bit of a renewed effort to push back against it, but it, it's, a, it's a very hard uh, battle. You know, the legislature's not open to doing it. You know, the trial lawyers are, uh, you know, the boon for them. Yep. You know, I mean, I've heard stories of guys that are out there at you know, job sites handing out shirts with, you know, 1-800-LAWYER or whatever on the back yeah. if you get hurt and call. But uh, it's, a, it's a long-term thing we have to work on, but it, it, it's hindering us because it makes it's one of the key reasons why things are more expensive, not just for, you know, dev for developers, school districts, you know, municipalities, everyone's got to pay the same insurance. Right. So it, it, it raises our costs higher than anywhere else in the, in the country. Is there, is there a way that... And it doesn't make us much safer. There's no statistic shows because we have this law in place that we're a safer place. We're yeah. actually down at the bottom. See, and that's what I was going to ask. Is, the, is there ways that, it, like, have you spoken to the insurance companies about the reason why this huge premium, why they're even charging I mean, that could, amount? They need to protect against the loss from the, the, the law in place. But, you know, we, we got we to gotta fix it. I mean, uh, a lot of insurance are pulling out of New York because they don't want to, you know, take it on. They don't want to keep covering. So yep. now you're having those ramifications yeah. that could occur so it makes it consequently. Even, even harder. So that's a, it's a big thing. It's a, you know, long-range problem. But, uh, you know, if we could, if we can get some type of relief from it, it would help you know, lower cost for everyone across the board in New York. Is there, but there must, I mean, the large, you just talked about some of the opponents, there must be a huge push against you guys. Yeah, that it's, it's, listen, be, it's, not it's not something, it's not something that uh, Libby or the building industry in and of itself, it's going to take a large coalition of like-minded groups to, to get it done. Right. And, and to constantly chip away and, and message and educate. Most people don't even know what it is. I had to look it up before I even got here, you know, a year ago and took this job. Luckily, I did because they asked me that many of your questions. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that, and I know that's a, uh, as you said, the trial lawyer side, plaintiffs, plaintiffs firms love that mm -hmm. uh, very much. So, with the, the labor law 240, 241, yep. uh, those are huge issues where they can just collect it. And there, what about the? There's no discussion at all about uh, s some sort of offset among the among the. the, 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 there's, the there's, va there's various discussions on different things, but not, nothing's ever moved. Nothing's you know? ever. I moved. mean, we're, we're trying to get a, a charitable exemption. You know, we, have, we run Long Island uh, Home Builders Care, which is a charitable organization that, you know, w we were trying to do a, a ramp for someone who was in a wheelchair. You know, it's a $7,000 project, but I think the insurance costs were $20,000. Wow. So it's prohibitive. So we, we can't, you know, we have so many people that, you know, of our members that would want to give back, but because of the scaffold law, we can't do these projects that we were doing before. Uh, so it, it's really, you know, it's hindering the, you know, charitable work and good things yeah. we would like to be doing. That's a shame because mm -hmm. I know that that would have been a nice addition that yeah. we can offer, but unfortunately it's prevented, yeah. prevented from. So now we have this gas stove ban and Long Island was irate over it mm -hmm. and, and it passed, it passed in the state ledge. And it's now going to be banned from future projects, I believe, beginning after 2026. 2020, after 2025. 2025. 2026, yeah. Yeah. So where, there's a huge lawsuit about it now. Mm -hmm. Where's Libby's stance on it? Because Libby, now you, yeah, we, are, uh, we opposed it when it was coming up. And, and we said, listen, we understand that this is the, you know, the future. We're, we're moving in that direction. You know, we want to be uh, good stewards of the environment and stuff like that. But we, we need a transition. Uh, we can't just pick an arbitrary date, throw it out there, 2026, 2025, whatever, whatever the year is, and say, okay, we're going for that. You know, there's a big push in the state to get to net zero in a certain amount of time. And All right, I understand that, but let, let's have a plan in place. Living here on Long Island, we've all seen, I mean, I was just in my house the other day, and the power went out for two hours. Right. You know, Transformer blew or something like that. We were at a, you know. But now we're adding all this electric capacity or adding all this load to the grid. Right. The question is, can the grid handle it? You know, you're putting more EV charging stations up there. You're putting more appliances and stuff on there. Can it ha handle it? And is it reliable enough to count on that? So those are big questions we have 
to have good answers on before we decide to move forward with this. As you mentioned, there is a lawsuit going on, you know, in California, in Berkeley, California, they did this, and a federal judge, you know, ruled it down, it says the federal law actually supersedes this, the, the local law, the state law, and you can't ban uh, gas stoves or gas appliances. So we're taking the same argument now to New York State. We're part of a coalition with the uh, plumbers and the uh, propane industry, you know, barbecue people, fireplace folks, yeah. uh, you know, builders and contractors, you know, all saying that this, you know, we got to slow this down. We got to answer some hard questions first. So we'll see what happens with that. There was just a big rally uh, a few weeks ago on that. Uh, you know, again, and it's a bipartisan. It's, it's, it's contractors, developers, unions, you know, Republicans, Democrats. Everyone is coming together saying, oh, let's pump the brakes on this. Because I'm also wondering, uh, ignoring the, the, the pragmatic side, right, which, which is funny to say, but ignore the rational, reasonable uh, ev- issues that you're, you're looking at. Are you, do you even have the buyers who'd want that? Like, legit, like truthfully, if, if I had a choice of a home where it's here's a brand new home, but it's all electric yeah. versus the older homes, because remember, it's only new buildings. So all these 2020, 2022, 20, all these homes that are now involved or even just all these homes before these, this, this date. Wouldn't I want that home because that home is going to be more diversified on energy? And then yeah, I, get to, uh, I get to have the gas stoves. I exactly. Get to use, I get to use my, my, my I, God forbid, electric goes out. I can still cook something mm-hmm. if I need be or anything. Now once I'm screwed, yeah, uh, I think it. I think it's the retrofit kicks in later in like 2030 or somewhere. But yeah, I mean, the, you know, first of all, you're going to pay more for it. Uh, you know, going all electric, there's a cost associated with right. it. So it, it's going to be costly or upfront. You may save some on your electric, you know, over time. Um, but now it's lifestyle change. Uh, like, I mean, listen, people, I had a, uh, my first home, I had to get, uh, excuse me, electric stove. I hated it. I, the first time in my life I ever had electric stove. I was like, Definitely. why does it take forever to cook an egg? Yeah. Okay, I'm at a house now, I got gas. I'm not changing that. Yeah, uh, not doing it. You know, commercial kitchens, I think they may be exempt in this law, but they, they put up a big fight saying, like, Yeah, can't. commercial kitchens yeah, are exempt we in can't, that. We can't cook in this with, with uh, Because that's electric. ridiculous. Makes no sense. Yeah, and then the retrofitting, that's interesting about how it's later on. Later on. So, so like, there's, you know, it kicks in right now for, uh, I think, buildings under seven stories starting in 2026. So sm- smaller buildings... Got to go all electric, and then then a few years later, it's larger buildings, and then you know further out, it's everything, and then it's you know now if your gas stove goes at some point in time in the future, there's no gas stove to replace it with. Right, you got to go all electric. Yeah, and then, yeah, but what do we do with all this gas in, gas infrastructure that's in place now? Correct. You know what do we do? Are we just, just scrapping it. Yep, that's and that's uh, these. This is the collateral issues that are all associated. When you, when you make one decision, it's never just one dimensional. Mm-hmm. Every decision is multi-dimensional in, in, in effect. And I think it's, it's evident where it, it, people are, are not taking that consideration and our politicians need to focus on a more expanded way of thinking as they promulgate ideas. Yeah. And I, I appreciate Libby for advocating on behalf of Long Islanders to make all these issues known and make it and make them aware of what's happening to us and standing up for us when it's going to change our way of life in a devastating way. Mm-hmm. So I, I appreciate it immensely. I just want to thank you uh, so much for coming on to this show, talking about these issues, highlighting these issues, what Libby does, and showing that you're the strength of, of Long Island. I'm looking forward to seeing what you do in 2024, buddy. Yeah, I appreciate it. Great conversation. Uh, look forward to doing it again sometime. Thank you so much. All right, Mike, take care. 